Well, good morning and welcome to Hudson Institute here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are a resource or organization focused on promoting American leadership for a secure, free, and prosperous future. I'm Jeremy Hunt and I'm a media fellow here. And uh, today we'll be discussing when deterrence fails, the Iranian proxy threat in the Middle East. And I'm honored to have here my friend, Congressman Rich McCormick. And uh, just an honor to have you here. Congressman McCormick is a decorated veteran and emergency room physician who proudly serves Georgia's 6th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. He was uh, raised by a single mother. Congressman McCormick was a paper boy in middle school and eventually worked his way through college, earning a degree from Oregon State University. Uh, a firm believer in service before self, Congressman McCormick joined the Marine Corps and became a helicopter pilot. During his two, two decades of service, he deployed to combat zones in Africa, the Persian Gulf, and Afghanistan. And as a Marine, he flew helicopters, was airborne, and attached to Army and foreign forces, and taught at Georgia Tech and Morehouse College as a Marine officer instructor. In the Navy, Congressman McCormick earned the rank of commander and served as department head for the emergency medicine department in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And between deployments, he earned his Master of Business Administration from National University uh, and his medical degree, medical degree from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, where he was honored to serve as student body president. He completed his residency in emergency medicine through Emory while training at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. And most recently, the congressman served as an emergency room physician at Northside Hospital. In Congress, the, the Representative McCormick serves on the House Armed Services, Foreign Affairs, and as well as the Science, Space, and Technology Committees. Uh, and he also serves on the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. It's such an honor to have you here, Congressman. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here with you today. Yes. So we wanted to, I wanted to start off, um, first, I guess on, on a somber note, I wanted to start off just talking about the, the three soldiers that we lost, all three of which um, are from our home state of Georgia. And um, Sergeant William Jerome Rivers of Carrollton, Sergeant Kennedy Ladon Sanders of Waycross, and Sergeant Brianna Alexandra Moffitt of Savannah. Um, and what should our commander in chief be saying to soldiers like, like they were in harm's way right now in the Middle East who are um, just been under all these different attacks from these Iranian proxy groups? Um, what, what should we be saying to them this time? Oh, first of all, sorry we didn't do better. Yeah. Uh, it, this was avoidable. Uh, we have not shown anything but weakness, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, we did something in retribution. We went out and bombed the Houthis. Uh, we, we've shown some flexing power, but uh, if you think about it, we've been attacked around 170 times. That's right. Uh, and we continue, if you, if you go back uh, for the last three years, hundreds of times, and we've never really done anything other than defend ourselves, but not defend ourselves through strength, but basically like boarding up your windows, uh, saying, I'm going to take out your drone. Uh, but we haven't attacked the real problem, which is Iran. Right. And if you look at Iran and what they're doing around the world, whether it be in Ukraine, uh, in Israel, uh, or any other proxy area all around the world, they are a bad actor. And they're using weaponry not just to go after our allies, but even worse, they're going against American troops. American troops. Now, if you're, just in, in, in general, if you're talking about a country that's producing weapons, disseminating weapons, and encouraging those weapons to be deployed against American troops, how should our response be geared? Uh, if you're the president of the United States, if you're the commander in chief, your sole responsibility is to look after American citizens, That's right. especially our, our soldiers, Marines, sailors. We know that they were put in harm's way. We did a good job in defending them, but that's not the whole story. If I was president for a day, and I'm going to say something kind of controversial here, I understand, but if I was president for a day, first of all, all, all cards on the table. I'm going to absolutely put any kind of political pressure you can, any kind of uh, economic pressure on you. I'd be undercutting your, your energy production. And by the way, if you have production of a weapon system that's being used against American troops, maybe even our allies, I would take that out. Now, that doesn't mean I have to go blow up a, a city block or a city. Uh, and we've done that in the past, by the way. Uh, it could be barbarians and we'd bomb your whole city. So. If you're going to produce those sort of weaponry and then disseminate it and encourage it to be used against us, I'll set off an EMP. I'll design a warhead that literally goes into your city on a tomahawk, blows up, and, and then takes out that city block like that. And every time I have another attack after that, I'm going to do the same thing. Matter of fact, every part of that city that has production capability for that, that uh, drone that's being used against us, I'm taking it out. Oh, there's going to be other collateral damage. Very few people die, but it will make a point. I'm going to hamstring you. I'm going to make your life miserable. I'm sending you back to the Stone Age. You're going to be cooking with, <laughs> with wood uh, because I don't want you to do that. And I want you to suffer. 
I want you to suffer dramatically. I want your people to suffer so that they don't look at their government and say, you're doing such a great job. I'm scared of you. I want their people to say, I am sick and tired of this. This is a theocracy. We have no real representation. They're, they're, the, the, we shouldn't be encouraging the rebels, encouraging them to stand up against this oppressive, nasty, evil government. Sure. Uh, and that's what I would do. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing that. And I mean, and if you think about it, even going back, I'm just kind of we think about how we got here. How do we get to the place where these groups are just so emboldened at a level we've just never seen before? And and I, a lot of people will point to the failed Iran nuclear deal that, you know, Biden, President Biden, it kind of his first um, his first few months in office kind of wanted to reestablish this failed nuclear deal. I mean, do you, do you see that as kind of the, the start of all of this? Where, where do you kind of see the, in terms of the steps that led us here? Yeah, well, first of all, he freed up money, I think around $7 billion. That's that $7 right. billion funds a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's allowed them with energy production, taking off some of the uh, sanctions uh, to make more money. And he's undercut our energy production, which of course makes their energy production more valuable, which makes them a more wealthy country, which right. makes them free to do more things. So every single aspect, whether it be uh, through isolating them as a nation, uh, allowing them to make more money through uh, energy production, or by freeing up the money that they were trying to get access to anyway, those are all showing weakness, showing, I trust you. Well, they've never been trustworthy. They've always been bad actors. These right. people hate us. They hate us. When we talk about Israel, that is little Satan. We are big Satan. Listen to their rhetoric. They want us destroyed. They support people who are trying to destroy us. They support our, al they support our enemies, whether it be Russia, China, North Korea. These people are bad actors, whether it be the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah. These people are bad actors. Whether it be uh, terrorist groups in Africa, mm. they are everywhere. And I, get, I guarantee you they're in South America too. Uh, I guarantee you they're in Central America because they want to be disruptors. Their whole premise is to go against the United States and to spread their, to apostolize, to, to make sure that their, their message of hate and discontent is spread throughout the world. Right, right. And we saw even before the attacks in, in Israel on October 7th, just a, you know, a few weeks before that we heard from, uh, I think it was Jake Sullivan said, you know, this is the quietest the Middle East has been in, in decades. Um, you know, what, what do you think, what failed in terms of our, some of our intelligence agencies that to, 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 to understand what the Iranian threat was and what, and what ended up happening uh, in Israel. What is your take on that? You can never let your guard down. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we saw it with 9-11. Um, we have let our guard down again, by the way. And it's not just the young lady who is uh, Lakin Riley, who was killed in, in Georgia by an illegal immigrant who had been arrested not once, but twice and released and kept staying in America yeah. as they violated me. It's not just the people who literally, I had a guy give me a, a ride uh, the other day, who'd been in America for four months, he said when he came across, four people that were traveling in their caravan were bragging about murdering people. You want to know why Venezuela's crime rate so far down? They've shipped all their criminals to us. Yeah. We're letting our guard down. We're literally letting, we have two million people in the United States. We don't know who they are, where they came from. We, they're, they're literally evading us yeah. because our, our border is so porous because all of our border agents are processing people rather than keeping people out. We have horrible laws. We are letting our guard down. And when something bad happens, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to blame us. Because that's what these, I don't even know what to say. I'm going to say a really bad word. But these people who don't care about America, they're trying to, over, they're trying to mess with the census. They're trying to gain congressional seats where they shouldn't have them right. based on illegal immigrants that we're going to have representation from. Yeah. This is transforming America. If you think about how narrow the majority is, a two-vote majority right now, if you bring in 14 congressional seats worth of people that are likely going to vote for Democrats. Because why? Because they're impoverished. They're uneducated. They need handouts. This is transformative. But I don't, I don't really want to focus on the southern border other to say that letting your guard down results in bad things. Right. Israel let their guard down. That's just fact. I mean, their intelligence agency is very good. But to not see that coming, to not be ready for Hamas to come across and do what they did and have no response. It is what it is. Uh, they've learned their lesson. Now they're trying to right or wrong, but you can never let your guard down. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, this is what we do every time we trust Iran because they've never, ever, ever been our friends. That's right. At least not during this theocracy. That's right. And, and you know, one thing we also heard, uh, you mentioned the 170 attacks on American troops. Um, we've heard that a lot of these, you know, from, uh, I think it was, 
uh, one of the senior officials said that, well, you know, no serious injuries other than TBIs. We've kind of heard this idea that like TBIs is kind of a soft, uh, not, not a big deal. Well, you're, you're a physician. I imagine you treat a lot of TBIs. Can you just talk to just the seriousness of, of that type of injury? And, and I mean, it's a life-altering injury. Is yeah. that not correct? Well, well and let's, let's, let's look at the intent. Intent means everything. Were they trying just to give you a TBI? Of course not. They were trying to kill you. Right. right. And now they have killed us. And it's just a matter of time before somebody else dies. It's just a matter of before somebody else is murdered in the United States. Uh, this, this idea that, oh, yeah, he shot me with a BB gun, but it, but it only hit me in the forehead. Okay, but what about when it puts your eye out? Are you waiting for it to put your eye out? I mean, right. this insane idea that because it hasn't resulted in something worse means it won't. Well, it's in, that's ridiculous. It's a matter of a time. Right. Um, same thing with everything that's going on in the United States. It's a matter of, it's not if, it's when and how bad something's going to go amiss. Um, we have overwhelming evidence that bad things will happen when you just continue to let bad, when you, when you allow small crimes. Mm -hmm. Big crimes always happen. That's, that's through and through. That's why we changed the laws here in, in Washington, D.C., because we're letting criminals out. Uh, the average murderer has been let out of jail I think nine times in Washington, D.C., seven times in other cities, because they will escalate. If you don't punish them for small crimes, they will do big crimes. That's psych basic psychology. Yeah. This idea that Iran is different from everybody else in the world, when you allow them to get away with small things, they'll do bigger things. They are trying to develop nuclear weapons. They have talked about eradicating all Jews and eliminating Israel. I take them for the word. If China says they're going to take over Taiwan and they produce all of our AI chips, I take them for the word. When they, when they produce 37% of the world's logic processors, and it would disrupt the entire world, I mean, we think COVID was bad. This would be catastrophic. It's just a matter of time. What are we doing? Right, right. Be strong. Be the United States. Be global leaders. Because there is a movement inside the Republican Party, and I, and I want to address this because I think it's very important. A lot of people think that by being isolationist, by putting America first, which I am all for putting America first. But isolationists, we're not going to help Israel. We're not going to help Taiwan. We're not going to help Ukraine. We're not going to help whomever. We're going to stay out of it. We're going to let Europe take care of their own problems. You can do that. And it's been tried before. Reagan talked about this all the time. The problem is that you're a city across the sea, but don't think it's not coming. That's right. And, and don't think that you can bury your head in the sand and that nothing. We've been through this multiple times. And oh, by the way, isolationist countries never thrive economically either. And China was the world power in the 13th century. They, they circumnavigated the world before Magellan did. They had more technology, wealth, economy. They had every, they, then all of Europe combined. And then they became isolationists. And eventually they became so disempowered that Japan took them over. Yeah. In just a couple of, an island state took over entire, like one of the most populous countries and the most populous country in the world like that because they had nothing. Because once you become an isolationist, you deteriorate very rapidly. And we always criticize, oh, Marxism, it's never worked. Why do people ever try that? Isolation it never has either. And, and if good. you're not a global leader, you're going to encourage globalism. And we always talk about defeating communism, defeating Marxism, defeating globalism. If you want to do that, be the global leaders we are. Yeah. Flex the muscles of a $27 trillion economy. All of Europe combined has less than that. Yeah. All of it, we have, Russia, when we're talking about Russia and Iran, we have three states, three states in the United States that have a bigger GDP than Russia. We should be crushing this. We should be dominating. And I'm not saying we oppress the world, but we make our mark. We spread what we know works. We encourage our allies to thrive. Yeah. That's America. That's leadership. And it leads other people not to turn to China and Russia and Iran and North Korea for anything that they need. They turn to us. And the one thing that's happened good out of the Ukrainian invasion is Germany and the rest of Europe now has turned back to the United States for leadership and says, I want you as my friend. We've expanded NATO in a very good, solid way. Sweden is going to be amazing. Finland is going to be amazing. Uh, having strong friends that have strong militaries, that have strong economies, right. that's only going to make us better in this world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I want to talk, too, about, you talked about American leadership. And one of those things I think that a lot of Americans might take for granted is, is how a lot of our cost for goods are lower because we have freedom of the seas. I mean, we we have a, we have a, an ability to make sure that our, our trade global trade is protected. And these a lot of these kind of Houthi attacks and and, and and the Red Sea, and but also just all over in a lot of different places. What do you see as like, what's kind of your message for, for folks who don't quite totally understand how the, the the freedom of the seas when we lose that 
it does affect us at home in a significant way. And we've seen this, even just recently all the attacks on Houthis on, on our shipping vessels. And it's funny because um, this has always been a problem. When we first became a nation, Great Britain was actually uh, uh, pirating our ships and taking our men into their, their military. And actually, George Washington had to come up with the Jays Treaty, which he almost got impeached for, by the way, because he said, we're not powerful enough to, to resist that. Mm. What's funny about that, since this time, I'm going to take a little history lesson here with the Barbary Pirates. Teddy Roosevelt, we talk about um, when you have these sea lanes closed down, it's disruptive to everybody's economy because it's not just one nation. It's two nations that are trading between each other. It's right. actually passageways for people to actually migrate. And, and then we had this problem recently in Somalia. Remember the Somalian pirates and, and how we dealt with it. Once we dealt with it with force, and this is what pirates understand. Pirates understand, whether it be Blackbeard <laughs> or, or, the, or Barbary pirates or it be Somalian pirates, when you, when you flex on them, when you show the military might of the United States, it's over. And the Houthis understand, just like anybody else, anybody who thinks they're powerful, wait. We have not been outgunned in a very long time. And if we show our force, we show that if you're going to do this, if you're going to disrupt our, our economy, disrupt our people, take people's lives, jeopardize us, yeah. we will kill you. I, I know it sounds like a harsh word, but people understand if there's real consequences. If you're going to murder somebody, I'm going to kill you. If you're going to pillage on the seas, you're going to go away. And people understand that if there's serious consequences, those crimes go away. You're actually helping them because you're not encouraging them to do something evil that's putting their life in jeopardy too. When you show force, when you show that there are consequences, you're, it's just like disciplining your children. You're helping them. They're not going to run in the street if you, if you say stop because they're disciplined. But if you don't, something bad is going to happen. It is good for everybody to show strength, to bring back, um, to rein in the terror that's, that's bad for everybody. Yeah, but for a lot of, for, for, especially for Iran, I mean, the only language they understand is force. I mean, Absolutely. there's no doubt about it. And I want to, I mean, in terms of, in general, do you think that the, I want to talk about the retaliatory kind of strikes that we've been launching now. Uh, do you think those are working? Uh, you know, how, where are, do you think that we are, uh, at least now, we know that it was probably a little too little too late, but at this point, do you think that you see these kind of being effective in the future now? So it's a start. But once again, I go back to the head of the snake, right? If the, if the Houthis and Hezbollah and Hamas are being supplied and encouraged by a funder, by the person who's giving them all the weapons, uh, I, I mentioned the EMP, but I'll, I'll go a step further, maybe even something that you do prior to that is cyber warfare. Uh, one of the things that we are constantly attacked by Iranians and Russians and Chinese uh, and, and these, these criminal groups that come in and take possession of our, you know, and ask for ransomware, um, we should be doing that to them every time they, they mess with us. And, and I think, and it's interesting, I brought this up at NATO. I'm, I'm a, one of the voting members of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And I brought this up to the head of NATO forces, and he said, well, do you want to have a war with, with uh, Iran? I'm like, we're at war with Iran. If you're, if you're attacking us with weapons, encouraging people to do, I would absolutely come out of there. Cybersecurity is a way to get to anybody. And we have the best technology. And I think we have the best hackers in the world. You hire them on, you disrupt everything that makes our life miserable, you disrupt. We are at war. I mean, we have, you have to admit what's happening here. Uh, when somebody walks into your store and carries out your, your, your goods, call it what it is. It's robbery. When somebody comes into your business and, and takes you by ransom and, and, and disrupts your, your business and shuts down your, your gas, your electric, your phone, whatever it is, call it what it is. It's terrorism, cyber terrorism. Uh, we should be going after them and making their lives miserable any way we can. I'm not saying we need to kill people because there's a lot of, I don't want to kill innocent people. Now, those days sometimes come when, when harsh times come, uh, you deal with it however you have to. I don't, put any, I don't take anything off the table as, as a commander in chief. But if you want to do what you, you can, you can make people's lives very miserable. Make them pay the price for doing bad things. Yeah. And on the, on the question of the tech too, I mean, we've seen just some of the new kind of technology emerging out of Iran, especially with the drones. I mean, but then even now they have these underwater drones. And uh, so what, what is your take on what, like, what you can say that's unclassified? <laughs> what is your take on, on some of the new technology capabilities that they're having? I mean, is this, um, are, are we, do you think that we are keeping up a pace in terms of that? We are. And, and matter of fact, there's no way that the reason that China hasn't pulled ahead of us is because we have certain components of computer chips. And you can, there's a wonderful book, uh, called Chip Wars. Highly recommend it. I think it's Chris Miller who wrote it. And uh, it talks about the development of technologies and how it affects warfare. Uh, the fact that we decimated the fourth largest army in the world in, in a few days in Iraq. 
uh, during Desert Storm is because we had a technological advantage. We didn't have to overwhelm them with, with mass volume. Uh, but this is where we have to keep that leading edge technology. This is where China's trying to get ahead of us. And they right. can if we're not careful. This is why sanctions are very important. We need to make sure that China's not flexing against Taiwan. Uh, if they take the chip industry in Taiwan at TSMC, you're talking about 100% of our AI. We can't recover. If we started a chip factory right here, now we have tons of, the chip, CHIPS Act addressed basic technologies, uh, but it does not address our AI, which is produced over there in a cheap way, in, in a great way. But if you have all your eggs in one basket and China literally tells you, I'm going to take over by this country by 2027, once again, I take you for your word. If, if Putin says, I'm going to take Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, Moldova um, I take you for your word. I don't take that lightly, and this is what I, I, I want to make sure that we as Americans are having a real conversation, not an idealistic conversation, but a realistic, pragmatic conversation yes. about what that means. It would ruin our economy. It would ruin our defense industry. It would put us behind very nefarious people who could then take us out sure. and make sure that we are in jeopardy of even survival. And these things are for real. This is why our technological uh, investments are super important. That's why our, our technologies need to be guarded. That's why even though we have basically a million students from all over the world studying in our universities, we need to make sure that our leading technologies are protected and preserved for America. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we close here, I just, I guess I would love to hear what you think. Um, what do you think is Iran's end game in this? You know, as, as I was a tell officer, you kind of put on the enemy's hat, you try to understand what they're thinking. What is their end game here? And, and how do we, um, and secondly, how do we message to Americans at home, you know, why this matters? Sure. So understand in the theocracy, everything's based on the religion. They're Shiites. Uh, you have the Shiites and the Sunnis, you have other smaller sects of, of Islam. And the Muslim faith isn't all radical. And we know, we, we have friends in the military who are Muslims, that they're good people. Yeah. So I'm not trying to vilify religion, but what I am saying is there are certain segments of religion that call for the destruction of Israel, the United States, and anybody who's not Muslim, basically. Right. And this is what we're dealing with. Uh, Iran has made it, made it their mission to disrupt any country that doesn't have a theocracy that's run by Shiites. That's a problem. That's their end game. Their end game is to dominate the world. They think they're going to do that by proselytization. If you look at what's happened in Africa, there's, there's villages that have been wiped out. If you're, not, if you're not this sect of Muslim, they kill everybody yeah. unless you convert. That's their way of spreading the religion. That's a horrible thing. Ironically, in my faith, uh, uh, in Christianity, it spreads better when it's persecuted. It's ironic. Um, but that's what we've seen over, over time is, is there's two different approaches to religion. You can either be a pacifist or, or have that motivation by love, or you can say, I'm going to dominate, I'm going to kill. You have to figure out how your religion is founded and what's going to continue religion, and that's what's going to define us. And if you want to talk about the end game of Iran, they want world domination. They think they're going to have world domination. They think they're promised it by God. I'm telling you, it's not God. But that's what we're at war with. Well, thank you so much for being here, Congressman. I really appreciate you sharing your insights. And to everyone watching online, we really appreciate you joining us. And please check back at Hudson.org for more events we'll have in the future. Uh, thanks again. We really appreciate you being here. My pleasure.